our objective in this video is to understand the Coulomb's law and our focus would be on the terms like four pi and epsilon naught and why they are there in the final formula. Let's jump in. Coulomb's law is for the point charges. This is the point charge and so is the red one. But what exactly are they? When the size or dimension of the charged object is much less than the distance between them, we assume it to be the point charge. Again, assume there are two point charges, Q1 and Q2, separated by some distance R. Here we have assumed that charges are unlike in nature, that is Q1 is positively charged and Q2 is negatively charged. Important point to note here is that the nature of charges hardly matters in the formula. According to the Coulomb, the force is directly proportional to the product of the magnitudes of the charges. Which means, if the magnitude of Q increases, then the force also increases. And also it states that the force is inversely proportional to the square of distance between them. Which means that the distance between them increases, then force decreases. This is the formula according to the law which says that the force is directly proportional to the Q1 times Q2 divided by R squared. But in order to uh, remove this proportionality sign, we must insert one proportionality constant in the equation and that's k. Here k is called as the Coulomb's constant or it's also known as by the name of the electrostatic constant as uh, we are using it across the electrostatics. The value of k is 1 upon 4 pi epsilon naught. Here, epsilon naught is called as the permittivity of free space and has value of 8.85 into 10 to the negative 12th Coulomb squared per Newton meter squared. By substituting this value back, we get the value of k as 9 into 10 to the 9th Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. Now, We'll understand why there is this epsilon naught term in the formula and to understand it better, let me briefly introduce you to the concept of polarization. Again, take the same schematic diagram of two point charges separated by some distance r. Initially, also assume that the system is present inside some medium. Here, the electric field of Q1 will act on Q2 which is from right to left and it is represented by E. As this is happening inside the medium, there is presence of molecules of the medium as well. Because of this electric field E, these molecules get oriented or aligned in the direction of electric field, which means the positive charges would be away from Q1 and negative charges would be towards Q1. Because of this alignment of molecules, another electric field will be induced in the system in the direction opposite to the direction of actual electric field. And this electric field is called as induced electric field and is represented as E sub i. This induced electric field and the actual electric field are opposite to each other. Hence, it is decreasing the effect of force acting between the two charges. But, what about the permittivity? Remember, if permittivity of a medium is higher, then medium is permitting or allowing polarization to happen easily. This leads to greater induced electric field, which in turn decreases the effect of force between the charges. So this is all about the permittivity, which is denoted by epsilon. Let's say from the system, if I were to suck all the air out, 
then this has become the free space and its permittivity is denoted by epsilon naught. The story is same again. If we increase the epsilon naught or in other words the permittivity of vacuum then force would decrease. Hence we see there exists an inverse relation between force and permittivity of vacuum that's epsilon naught. If we are thinking that in vacuum how polarization can happen when there are no molecules present answer to that question lies in the quantum electrodynamics which is far far beyond our scope now let's understand why there is four pi term in the formula and let me revise you the concept of angle when we have an angle in two dimensions or in a plane we call it as plane angle or planar angle. To show it, let's use a circle of radius r. Take an arc of the circle as shown here. The angle subtended on the center of circle is the planar angle theta. When arc length is equal to the radius of circle, we call it as one radian, which is the unit of an angle here. The total planar angle in two dimensional space is 360 degrees or 2 pi radians. Now extend this idea in three dimensional space. Take a 3D sphere of radius r. Then take the surface area equal to the r squared. Subtend that area onto the center of sphere and subtended area on the center of sphere makes a solid angle. Simply said, a solid angle is three dimensional equivalent of the two dimensional angle. When the surface area on the sphere is equal to the radius squared, then it is called as one stair radian. And that, my friend, is the unit of solid angle. Observe in two dimensional space, we are taking an arc which is one dimensional and subtending it on the center of circle which is two dimensional. I mean, circle is two dimensional. Same way, in 3D space, we are taking a surface which is two dimensional and subtending it on the center of a sphere which is three dimensional. I mean, sphere is three dimensional, right? So basically, we are extending this idea of two dimensional angle into the three dimensional angle. So total solid angle in three dimensional space is 4 pi stair radian. But it is not explaining why we have a 4 pi term in the formula. And to understand that we take this exaggerated diagram of point charge Q1. Here this red 3D sphere is analogous to our point charge Q1. Q1 is emitting these lines of force in all the possible direction in the three-dimensional space. And in terms of mathematics, we can say that it is emitting these lines of force in 4 pi directions, 4 pi steradian directions. But Coulomb's law is giving us the force between the charges along line joining them which is just one line essentially. Originally, the point charge is emitting the lines of force in 4 pi stray radian directions and to have the force for one line, we must divide the formula by 4 pi. To take an example, uh, let's say the point charge is emitting 100 lines of forces but we want to calculate some quantity along one line. So we must divide that quantity by 100 so as to get the answer for one line, right? Same way, here we are dividing that force by 4 pi and if observed carefully, that 4 pi term is in the denominator. So finally, we have a formula F is equal to 1 upon 4 pi epsilon naught q1 q2 by r squared. I hope this was informative for you and I'd like to thank you for it.